So um, our next guest, I, I think she might be unlike anyone who's been on this couch in the past week and a half. Uh, Matina Roberts is a, a band leader and a multi-instrumentalist and someone who explores um, the specificities of American experience through music. She's from Chicago and lives in New York and has collaborated with a range of musicians, including Montreal's own Godspeed, You Black Emperor, a band with whom she shares a label home. Yes. So please welcome Matina Roberts. <laughs> welcome back to Montreal. Thank you. <laughs> it's a, this city is like a second home. Yeah, tell me, me. tell me about that. Your label, Constellation Records, is based here, but you spent a, a, quite a chunk of time here. Yeah, I started spending... I've been coming to Montreal for, I don't know, when the for maybe the early aughts. I started coming to Montreal regularly thanks to um, the Suoni Popolo Festival. Uh, I got to play the that very first festival with the band that I was in at the time called Sticks and Stones. And I made a lot of really fast friends. It was so, at the Casa, it was so easy to make friends. And um, I just started coming back regularly. And then I got to this period in New York where I just, I was um, spending a lot of time working, uh, trying to make money to afford an apartment that I really couldn't afford and trying to figure out, okay, well, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? Blah, 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 blah. And then I got pulled into a research um, program that was going on at McGill around uh, improvisation and social practice. It's called ICASP, um, the Institute for something, 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 something. Uh, I can't remember. Improvisation, community, and social, and social practice. practice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And uh, it allowed me to come to Montreal and spend you know, the legal time that I was allowed to be here for months at a time before going back to the States. So I did that for two years. Um, and during that time, I would workshop uh, some of my music and kind of like live rehearsals for people to see and also still work sh workshop my music in New York and other places around the world. And... Uh, Don and Ian from Constellation Records came to some of those workshoppings and became really interested in the music. Uh, I couldn't find an American label to put out the particular music that they are putting out for me. Um, and I remember they came to a loft show at a space called L'Anvers. Is it still here? No, no. okay. Uh, it's the, the plant, okay, the plant. Um, so I, I did a lot of things there and, uh, Don and Ian would come to those shows and, and one of the shows they came to or workshoppings, they were like, where's the record? It's like, oh, there is no record. They're like, oh, well, it's our, it'll be our record. We'll put out that record. And so that's how things, uh, began for me here. Can you tell us actually a little bit about that program? Because it sounds kind of interesting. You were working with indigenous so communities? So I was asked to... Uh, ICASP had received this grant from the Canadian government to study how improvisation can, can foster community building. And so they wanted to bring in different people to consult on that project. And I was one of the people that was brought in to do that. And it involved setting up a program in the attic space of this uh, uh, kids drop-in center called uh, Janus 2000, or Janesse 2000, sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, and it basically was a drop-in center for at-risk kids, a lot of at-risk indigenous youth, Canadian youth, a lot of um, at-risk uh, Afro-Canadian youth um, who would just come in after school. And we would sit with them in this attic space where um, McGill and also uh, the owners of Casa del Popolo and uh, uh, the Suoni Popolo Festival funded instruments to be in that room for those kids. And it was just kind of like that, it's kind of like that punk rock aesthetic of like, 
you know, like some of my favorite punk bands, they got together, said, we're going to start a band. None of them ever played instruments ever in their lives. And they booked their show. Like they had their first show like two weeks after they put their band together. It was like that kind of aesthetic and using improvisation. Um, and that program, as far as I know, is still going. So, yeah. Am I supposed to look at you or am I supposed to look at you? you? Can, I, like, I don't, like, who am I supposed to be looking at? I what? think you can look at all of us. Okay, because yeah. I'm feeling very self conscious <laughs> about that. Like, who am I supposed to be? Hi, hi, I mean, hi, hi, hi. Yeah. Do you think that, I, what did you learn from that program, though? I'm curious, like, did, do you feel like it was effective? It w well, what was really interesting for me because, um, well, yeah, I do think it was effective, but also, you know, my sojourn running through Canada is just really interesting how different Canada and America are different. You know what I'm saying? And how sometimes people like to group the United States and Canada together because we are on the same continent. But culturally, Montreal is very, you know, the whole, I remember the first time I went into a grocery store in Little Italy my French is pretty bad. If I had remained here, it would be much better. But um, I had gone into this grocery store, and the woman was speaking to me in French, and I, or Quebecois French, and I wasn't understanding what was going on, and she was getting really irritated. And I remember feeling like this huge sense of relief where I was like, oh, that's not racism. It's not sexism. It's this whole other ism. It's this nationalism that I've never been exposed to. So de dealing in that program, I felt like uh, kids were talking to me a lot about things of that nature. And then the whole, you know, the indigenous issues, the way um, Canada approaches Indigenous issues are, you know, they're still not on point, but they're way better than in the United States to me. So it was interesting to have discussions with these at-risk youth about how they felt about their communities. And then on top of that, the whole Afro-Canadian thing is this whole other thing that's very different from African-Americanness, where I was already coming, coming from a country where my president looks like my uncle, so I have a different, my whole idea about what blackness is, is sort of shifted in a way that it had not shifted for the youth that I had worked with here. And a lot of the Afro-Canadian youth was so funny when they found out that I had lived in Brooklyn and I lived in Bed-Stuy. They're like, yeah, Bed-Stuy. Like, what? Like, you know, Canada, Montreal is great. No, but it's not Brooklyn. Yeah, it's not Brooklyn, but Brooklyn is not all that, you know? So it's just interesting. Kids teach you a lot about um, development and how to be and how to notice nuance and how to, how, how to, to really involve yourself into, into something. I got a lot, of, a lot out of it, and there's still a lot uh, that I feel like will come to me much later down the line still. Um, you were already working <coughs> as a musician before you came into this program. What kind of pulled you into the academic side Oh, I you know, I'm not uh, into the academic side. Well, I mean, in order to have a career in music, art, or whatever you're doing, you have to stick your toes in as many different fountains. I'm not really, I'm not like thick in, the, in academia in the way that some people are because I don't, a lot of, the, a lot of my music comes from here and not from here. But I, but I am a thinker, and I do like to to kind of critically tear things apart. Um, but I also I grew up in a in a around a lot of uh, intellectual circles um, in Chicago, just a very socially uh, aware groups of people, and within that you had like a certain sort of intellectual realm. So I have uh, the vestiges of that, but I try to, I like dipping a toe there, but I don't ever want to be completely there. It doesn't feel right for me. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit earlier about Constellation saying, we're going to give you this home for your record. Um, I don't know if everyone here knows much about Constellation. Can you tell them kind of 
some of the values I guess behind behind the label. Oh, well, constellation to me is like the 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 little label that could like the their aesthetic is so much uh, so much reflects what I believe in. Like uh, I don't value the things that I own. I value the things that I can do. I value the things that I can learn. Uh, I value what is inside, not so much what's on the outside. And so Constellation, you know, is, um, I don't know quite how to describe them, but just to say, you know, their DIY aesthetic is incredibly important to their foundation and uh, having and being socially aware is really important to their aesthetic and you know, it's a very particular work ethic that to me is actually, is very Canadian. Like it's a very, they have a very, you know, put your nose to the grindstone kind of work ethic that shows in everything that they they do. And um, I really needed that music to exist in a space where I felt like it would be cared for in that way. And that's exactly what Constellation has done. Well, let's listen to um, some music from your first record, um, which is part of a of a series, and and we'll we'll get into that a little bit. But let's play a song to give people a sense of. of One of the musicians on that record is in this room. She's sitting right there. Marie. Bit a man, get a man. So that is a song called, that's half of a song, a nine minute uh, track called Libation for Mr. Brown. Um, and it's from the first record in a 12 part series called Coin Coin. Um, can you tell us, before we get into the, the series itself, can you tell us a little bit about what we're hearing there? What what you're trying to do with that, that uh, piece of music? Well, that's a rearrangement of a very famous poem by the great late Oscar Brown Jr. He's a great poet, um, musician. He had one of the very first uh, jazz TV shows in the States for a while, and he has a very prolific family of musicians. His daughter, Maggie Brown, is this amazing singer. But uh, for that record, I wanted, I got into listening to auctions and how interesting uh, the auctions are and that they sound, they're really hard to sing and they're, um, they sound sort of happy, but their things are being sold. Um, and I was going to write my own, and then I came across Mr. Brown's version, and I thought, oh, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to arrange that and add to it. So the the last segment of the... I don't listen to my own records. I should listen to my own records, but I haven't listened to that record in a really long time. And when I talk about all the things you could do for me, do to me, I wrote that segment. Uh, I extended his poetry. Um, I like group singing. I think it's really, that's something that I actually got from seeing uh, Montreal bands perform like a Silver Mount Zion, uh, for instance, which is one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, this group singing, people singing together, and this idea, because I actually really don't like to sing. I really, like I play saxophone. I, that's that's where my, that's the root for me. But in terms of dealing with this particular music, which is so narrative based, I just felt like, okay, I just feel like there needs to be singing and it needs to be community singing. So each segment of the work, with the exception of the last segment, because it was solo, um, always explores some area of group singing. And, and that particular poem is not particularly nice to sing. But it's an interesting, it's a joyful, I find a joy in it. For what I know about history, I am so obsessed with American history. The history of peoples, I'm so fascinated with where people come from. Um, that What's so great about that song is I, I know that I sit here today <clears throat> because there were men and women who had to exist 
in these these auction scenarios and they survived and because they survived I survived and my life is pretty good at the moment so there's something to be happy and joyful there how hard was it to actually get behind the mic and sing them put down the saxophone and and do this oh, thing you I find hate difficult. hate singing because I mean I don't want to like ex- excuse me if I'm offending any singers in the room, but I just like and I love and I listen to singers. I love great singing and I I listen to a lot of pop music and I listen to a lot of jazz. And I listen to all sorts of things, um, but I also wanted my voice to represent how people. What gave me kind of the the push is reminding myself that there's a tradition of people just singing to sing. And it's not about trained singing. I'm not a trained singer, as you can totally hear on that. And um, how people would just sing to get through things. And how when you read about like uh, tra- like uh, historical tragedies, or like, for instance, I'm thinking about the, um, the bombing uh, the bombing attempt in France uh, at the football stadium. Remember that? And, did it, and if you saw any of the footage of people leaving the stadium and someone decided to sing the national anthem and everybody started to sing along, it's like moments like that. Or you hear the history of the Titanic. When the Titanic was sinking, there were people singing. And, and knowing that people in prison, uh, on in uh, chain gangs, they sing. I'm really interested in that blurred line between the joy and the pain and trying to bring that together. And so that kind of gave me like the push to go, okay, well, I'll do this. But I don't want anybody to ever say I'm I'm a vocalist because, not because I quote unquote hate singing, like I said before, but because I know so many talented vocalists. I don't really have the right to say, yeah, I'm, you know, that, because it's not really my area of study. It's just something I'm dabbling in. Um, so you talked a little bit about the story of, of that piece in particular. Um, can you tell us a bit about the Coin Coin series and how how what you're doing on that song fits into the, the larger narrative? Well, the Coin Coin series is my attempt to kind of bridge a few things. My interest in... Um, I have a really particular interest in the spirit world and contacting the spirit world. And it's something I've dabbled in uh, since I was a small child. Um, And then I stopped dabbling in for a while because usually when you do those sorts of things, you need a guide. If you don't have a guide, it can lead to all sorts of, apparently can lead to like states of psychosis and things of that nature. It came became apparent to me that music was actually supposed to be my guide if I wanted to dabble in those things. So it was a combination of that, a combination of my interest in American history. I'm so fascinated by how completely fucked up America... Can I curse in here? Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, like, nervous. This is nerve-wracking. Um, but American history is so just... Uh, complex and complicated. Um, And there were so many different areas of that history that I've always wanted to look at. And I couldn't figure out a way to, you know, working on music and working on a craft, which is what being a musician should be, uh, takes a lot of time. And I was trying to figure out a way I could sort of combine things. So my interest in history, my interest in the spirit world, and my interest in some sense in my own ancestry. I have records of my own ancestry going back now to about 1750. And I just felt like I wanted to share that somehow and how could I push it together. Can you tell us about Coin Coin, the name and the person? Yes, so Coin Coin is a nickname of a a very famous uh, former slave woman that I'm related to by marriage. It's possible that I'm in there by blood, but I don't know for certain. Um, Who became a very powerful landowner in a uh, part of Louisiana called Natchitoches. Um, She created this whole area where free people of color could live and exist and have like a really incredible standard of life 
in America during a time period where you wouldn't expect that to be happening. She was the first uh, strong female archetype I'd been exposed to as a child. Uh, my grandfather used to call me Coin Coin, and I learned about her before I learned about Harriet Tubman and all these people. Um, and so I just decided that I wanted her to, the lore of that work to give me my push off into what I was after because her story, I heard about it every year of my life um, through family. And so I wanted to do something to honor what that story, what her story did for me and her, what her story did do for me is it just gave me a lot of courage to be who it is I'm supposed to be, to be, uh, to be out here doing what it is I'm doing, to be a black woman in the world. It was very particular, that story to me. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's who she is. You're also foregrounding um, a lot of women's voices in, in this work, um, in your, your own uh, as well. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that? Ask me that again. I'm foregrounding women's like actual voices in, in the music that you're hearing <clears throat> itself. Yeah, I am. Uh, the way history had been passed down to me, the way ancestral history had come down to me was mostly through the women. And I thought that was really fascinating. And at the time that I had started this project, I'd read a book. I cannot, I need to look up the author's name again. It was an ind indigenous uh, American woman. I think she was Navajo. And she had done research on her family, five generations. And she was trying to understand the linkages between trauma that existed in each generation and how, for instance, in each generation of her family, there was the trauma of alcoholism, and how that just went from generation to generation to generation to generation, but how no one ever really talked about it. And I found that really fascinating how, you know, like the idea of uh, humor, <clears throat> like your sense of humor, like people, you know, however funny you are, and you want to say that you know where that came from, that sense of humor comes from, you know, hanging out with your parents or blah, blah, blah. But where did their sense of humor come from and where did their parents... It's this through line that you really can... I feel like my sense of humor, for instance, there was somebody on a plantation somewhere being funny. That's why I can be funny because there's this through line... Um, that that happens and so I just I really wanted to place women's voices in a very particular way not forget about the men but to have some sort of root for myself um, in terms of how I feel about a quote-unquote woman's place in the world and and how I feel about uh, um, how people connect or not connect and how uh, people share stories. How much? Um, <clears throat> Twelve parts. This 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 project you embarked on was originally fashioned as as a twelve part series. Yes, it was ten. Okay. <clears throat> it was ten. How much? And why did I do involved? that? It was ten, but then I realized. So the other part of the project, in terms of trying to multitask all these things, like my interest in history my interest in uh, the spirit world and blah, 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 is that I also wanted to challenge myself as a composer. I was like, how can I challenge myself as a composer? And I figured that if I looked at these very particular historical segments that kept popping up, just kind of in the ether in my head, um, I could use each of those segments to work with different types of ensembles, to work with different configurations, work with different mediums. You know, at this point, I'm also working with electronics and video. Uh, that was the last record. Um, I saw having that segmented work as a way to challenge myself. But I also really love books. I love reading. I think reading is a 
is a real privilege. My great, great, great grandfather, my great, great grandfather didn't learn how to read until he was 42. Can you imagine? I can't imagine not being able to read. And so I called them chapters for that reason. Um, I And I do have a writing practice. So I was just trying to sew all these things together in a way that made sense for me. How much of the process of putting each of these chapters together is is planned in advance? I mean, or is it completely improvised with every record as you go along? No, so the whole framework has been planned out since 2005. The problem, <laughs> the problem is I didn't realize it was going to take me as long as it's taking. I started 2005 and I had this whole... I was like, by 2011, I'm going to have like a concert of all the segments. That was, I said, that's what I'm going to do. And it'll be like my ring cycle or something. And and that'll be it. But um, each segment, I become so, I get really in the world of the segment. And then I notice just new things that I can try and new things I can do. It also took some time because uh, it took some time to find a, the right label. And so there was a period where I was performing the work without there being records and then kind of had to backtrack to start over. And um, But everything's been mapped out. It turned into 12 chapters because I forgot that within the 10 ensemble configurations that I have mapped out um, that I'd forgotten the most important thing that I love doing and that's solo work, uh, solo saxophone work. Solo, just solo material, I think is really important uh, area of exploration as an instrumentalist. So I decided to tack on uh, these two solo segments that are very representative of me, myself, more so than this history. How do you see um, your solo repertoire as different from the ensemble work? Well, it's the process is similar, but the the emotive foundation is different. The vulnerability is way different. You know, even when I listen to that ensemble record and I go, "Oh God, yeah, I did record, I did say those things, and I didn't mean to say that." And it's you know, like uh, uh, Mr. Drummer, give our Mr. Bass play what? Where did that come from? But that was recorded live in the studio with the live studio audience. So, you know, too late is committed to uh, God. Every time I hear that, it's like, ah, oh, where was, who was that? That was not me. That was me. Um, I, but like chapter three for me is just incredibly personal in a different kind of way. And so I feel like the solo records have a different sense of vulnerability. Um, do I don't have a cold. I have a bad <laughs> allergy reaction today. Long story. You talked a little bit about how with each record you've kind of learned learned something different. So how so you had this twelve this twelve segment series mapped out that is taking more time than you thought. Um, and you're learning things along the way, which is obviously a natural thing that's going to happen. I mean, how much has the process of putting each each recording together changed? Well, it's bloomed into this whole other... Like, I'm not in a hurry, but I it's bloomed into this whole other thing. Like, the third chapter allowed me to explore making more visual artwork. I started making more visual artwork, working with more video, and I had my first exhibition of my artwork this year, which was a big deal for me. I never imagined that I'd be able to have a toe in that world, but now I have a toe there. And that's interesting. And it allowed me to um, just my my writing style has gotten richer over the, like I'm really excited working on this next record, how my sense and intuition and depth are they still need a lot of work but they're changing they're going somewhere else how do you how do you hone your intuition 
Oh, that's such a hard question. Um, how do I hone my how intuition? You, yeah, if you say your intuition needs work, what like what does that look like? Well, intuition is about a certain sort of self confidence and belief in oneself, and it's uh, it's a really hard thing for artistic people to plug into and to to understand that it is your birthright. That if you are a creative person and you, you know, we as creative people, we see the world with kind of like a third eye. There's a third eye in which we see things. There's a kind of a different reach of which we kind of go after things. There's a different way in, in how we think about, you know, ideas. Um, and so that has a lot to do with how you utilize your intuition. I think uh, it just takes practice. It's just practice. And the most important word of all time, the most important word of all time for creative people, it takes a lot of failure. <clears throat> I love failure. Failure is awesome. Like, it's just like... Uh, because I'll tell you, like, when I had uh, put together... Um, God, the word like is in my language. That's a very American thing. And like, and like, and like, like, like. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that. Um, when I put together the first record, when I finished the score, and I was like, OK, I'm going to do this. But this score looks crazy. Who's going to take me seriously with this? You know, And it bloomed into this whole other thing that I couldn't even. I didn't even imagine at the time would happen. And that's a moment that I was able to hone my intuition in knowing that when you, as a creative person, do something with intention, intention and also humility and just some sort of thankfulness to, not to some like sort of higher power, but just like the universe, like you're being used as a channel to communicate some really precious information. Um, once you kind of settle in there, there's no limit on on what you can do, or or there's no restriction. There's only restriction if you think there's restriction. Um, how much of your when you're talking about this actually being quite mapped out and you knowing the different ensembles that you want to work with? So in the actual process of recording or performing this music live, how much of it is improvised? Oh, Versus so a composition. But it's a it's a mix. I like I like reading music. I enjoy reading music. I'm not great at it, but I I'm good enough to like do like a, as a I've worked as a freelance musician in, in many different capacities in terms of like studio work and like side woman on different types of records and <clears throat> um, all sorts of things. I enjoy reading music. I spend a lot of time learning how to do it. So the, the compositions are a mix of Western notation and also uh, a mix of what is called graphic notation. I use a lot of graphic notation, which is pictures and drawings and sometimes words. And this chapter one was actually a game, a kind of convoluted game. Uh, piece. I, I like to use a lot of different techniques within, and then some improvisation. But I, it's not, uh, I don't like to, I don't really enjoy just completely, for myself, completely improvised sets of music. What is that? Can you describe the graphic notation a little bit more? Like, what kind of images? All over? sorts of things, like photographs. I collect old photographs. From the turn of the century, I also have photographs of my family from like the 1870s, 1850s. And so that got me interested in photography and how you can, <clears throat> there's, a, there's not a single thing, there's not a single image that you cannot look at in this room and not figure out some way to turn it into sound. That you cannot, like uh, there's not a single thing I can see where I'd be like, Oh yeah, I wouldn't, what would that be? Like it's sort of kind of like a descriptive process of uh, um, 
there's a cup of water and the cup of water is in a glass and the glass is reflective and the reflection is showing light and the light is blooming here. And there's so many different ways in which you can navigate that musically. Also, his, the history that I use in the pieces, um, there's a lot of... Uh, there are layers in those scores that you would only know if I told you they were there in terms of certain uh, years being turned into sounds. Like uh, you can take like the year 1827 and then you can look at that and go, okay, one, eight, two, seven. You can look at those as, as notes. You know what I'm saying? There's so many different ways. I am all for kind of like... Uh, outside of the box thinking in that way. But you also have to be very careful how you explain that to other musicians also. And so doing this work has also been a practice in trying to make sure that I get better at being able to communicate that to people. And then when the improvisation comes in, what I love about it in these pieces is it allows for the individuality. Improvisation is a very personal, individual thing, and it allows for the personality and the individuality of the improviser to come through, where you don't always get that in the written or the graphic scored sections. When you first started playing music, you started playing the clarinet, I believe. Yeah. So you were taught to read music. When uh -huh. did you? When did you kind of make the mental shift? Like this is not the only way I need to make or play music? Because I don't know if that occurs to a lot of people. Yeah, so I, like, I... I mean, thank God for music. Thank God for free music lessons in the public school system. That was how I was able to get um, free music lessons. Music was the only thing that sort of made sense uh, when I was a kid, like, trying to figure it out. But I still wasn't, you know, I was still that kid for any, like... Uh, band or orchestra nerds in here. I was still that kid who was always sitting next to the other kid and kind of looking at the other kid while I'm trying to look over here to play music, you know, sort of thing. And I remember that, I remember that change that was like fifth grade and it was a, a band director, her name was Mrs. Rogers and she saw me doing that. So she stopped the whole band. She's like, okay, we're playing the uh, 1812 Overture. And she was like, all right, clarinets, one by one, I want to hear you play those four measures. And she went, and then she got to me, and of course I couldn't play it. And she yelled at me about, you got to practice, you know, practicing, 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 practicing. And, uh, and I went home that week. I was so embarrassed to be so uh, pushed out like that. I practiced every day, and then I went back. And then she did it again, and I played it perfect. And I was like, right, so that's what it takes. But when I got further down the line, there were just certain things about music that I still didn't understand from a visual standpoint, from a Western standpoint. But I understood it in, um, from like colors or like a different combination of numbers. Uh, <clears throat> and then when I went to college, <sighs> I had some mean teachers who... Um, yeah, who constantly told me I didn't really have much to offer musically and that I needed to find something else to do. And that my favorite was, uh, the only way you're ever going to get a gig is you're going to have to marry a musician. <clears throat> that was awesome. That was the 90s, yeah. And uh, I was like, right. It's like, no. So it was, so my compositional style kind of came from trying to <clears throat> to say no I can make music any way that I want to make as long as I believe in it and also you know in I was in Chicago at that time and I was exposed a little bit at that time to the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians with people like Fred Anderson, Nicole Mitchell, David Boykins, Josh Abrams who wasn't in the organization but played with a lot of AACM people <clears throat> and those people were doing really amazing. Um, they're, re they're all really amazing thinkers. So I, I was exposed to that a little bit. And then within my own family environment, I was just always told that I could do anything I wanted to do. 
and that there's no one that can tell me. They can say, oh, you can't do it like that, but they can't tell me that I can't do it. So I think it was just like a combination of of people, places, and things. And I owe, it's a long list of people that I owe in thanks for that. Let's listen to another piece of music. This is from the second the second chapter of Coin Coin. This is a song called The Labor of Their Lips. So that's quite different from the first piece we heard. Yeah, that's very different. And what's so interesting about that section is it sounds very improvised, right? But what's happening during that entire section is there's a series, each of the scores, I really should start loading the scores back up online. There are bits and pieces of the score on an old Flickr page that you can find on my website. Um, But there's a series of different cues going on throughout that entire section. There are are horn lines that are going on that the musicians know to listen for, that they're supposed to go into certain sort of ideas, uh, concepts. There's some conduction. Uh, I was really influenced by the great late Butch Morris, a New York musician who formed this um, idea called conduction, a way of conducting improvisers. And I used to play in a band for for maybe four or five years in New York called Burnt Sugar that used conduction. And I used some conduction in my own music. So there's conduction going on where I think I'm like giving, there's like a thumbs up, thumbs down that means a particular sort of groove. There's body language, there's a body movement that I do that cues the band to go into a certain feel. And then when I do the opposite of that body movement, they move out of that feel. So everyone that plays that music, they have to have eagle eyes. It's really, it's really fun for me, and I think it's really fun for them. And then the opera singer is actually singing uh, music that was written by my great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather, the, the man that I told you didn't learn how to read until he was in his 40s. He taught himself how to read by... Um, copying uh, snippets from the Bible and placing it on staff paper and trying to teach himself how to write music. <clears throat> he made about 100 of those compositions. He even wrote copyright on them because he knew, he knew, he knew. Um, and so I used that music in that, in that piece and that's what the opera singer is singing. So it's like a collage. I call it panoramic sound quilting because I'm quilting all these different elements together within also the Western notated music that they came out of before they went into that. Can you talk a little bit more about panoramic sound quilting? How did you kind of hit upon this this phrase to describe what it is you're doing? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. It was a phrase I came up with a long time ago and I figured people would forget about it. And now that the work is solidified in a certain way. People ask me about it, and I don't mind talking about it. At first, I said, you know, quilting. Why did I choose quilting? Like, what am I? But my grandmother, my Mississippi grandmother, grew up in a family, one of 12 uh, sharecroppers, and the family used to quilt together. And she would talk to me about, like, what that process was. And it's just very much, it's, it really boils down to a strategy of layering. And I feel that's what I'm doing with the music. It's a strategy of layering and kind of sewing different pieces together to come up with these um, full-length scores. Yeah, and, and when you talk about layering, you're not just talking about music, you're talking about narr- like a, a kind of narrative. So in some ways, it's, it's mixed media. And in this last record, you use video. Yeah, it definitely is mixed media, and I I like craft work. I like making things with my hands, and so if I'm not making sounds on the saxophone, I like the act of feeling texture and ripping and cutting and gluing and, and piecing things together. And uh, the way my grandmother used to talk about quilting, it was like, well, you know, where did the material from the quilt come from and she would say oh it'd just be you know scraps from everybody's clothing that they had outgrown over the you know 
year or whatever. And then, you know, you have these scraps that seem like these throwaway things, but then when you sew them together, it creates this magnificent array of color and design and pattern. Um, and so I think that's, I'm kind of after that a little bit. You've referenced your family quite a bit uh, in this conversation so far. I mean, how much of, and you've also referenced your, your fascination with American history in general. How do you see the two kind of linked? Well, I just, like, I'm so, I'm so thankful to come from the history that I come from. I'm so fascinated uh, by, you know, these themes that no matter what your cultural background is, is you your family has explored, your bloodline has explored these themes of pain and joy and sadness and just c complete utter misery and then, you know, amazing happiness and just, you know, trauma and and uh, I'm so fascinated by the human experience, what it means to be human and the different kind of uh, terrains that we explore throughout. And my hope was this music would allow people to remind themselves that they're actually not that much different from the person sitting next to them because we have those commonalities. Um, I didn't really, personally, I thought that dealing with the history and dealing with American history and coming from this cornerstone of, a particular cornerstone of African-American history, I thought, yeah, America is finally ready to like, we're ready to talk about these issues. It's, you know, the president looks like my uncle. Forgetting that, you know, he barely got voted into the White House. It was like 49%, 51% or whatever. Um, and not like he's been the greatest president in the world. We don't need to talk about that. He's, But he's still, you know, he represented a particular kind of progress where it was like, okay, we're ready to talk about difference in America in a different way. Um, at this point, though, I feel like that's a naive, uh, that was quite naive on my part. I just took your question somewhere else. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I'm a little spacey today. Why was it naive? Uh, because uh, uh, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, uh, Philando Castro, um, uh, Alton Sterling, uh, so many, you know, Tamir Rice. Um, God, like so it like it's it's like a twilight zone right now. Like I don't understand completely what is happening at this time. And I feel I feel like it's representative of a previous time that I actually have talked about in the music because I thought, oh, we're people will listen to this music and they'll be able to see beyond like ideas of race and difference and gender and class and they'll be able to see this humanness that I'm trying to get to no we are still a mess and so uh, that is something that is consuming my thoughts uh, in regards to the direction of the music right now so you know I think a lot of times when when people put out music that may touch on whatever's going on in the world, often people want to take a step back and say, well, no, I'm not, I'm, but I'm also not trying to be political. I'm not trying to make a statement. I mean, you're clearly saying here that you had a bit of like intent um, to educate, that you want to be attached to, to kind of a, a justice narrative in a way. Well, I didn't want to, I didn't, oh. I get, you know, that's the problem with artists talking about their own art, right? There are like things that we don't see even when we talk about it. And that's just common. I didn't really, I wasn't, the justice narrative for me just come, comes from my upbringing and the, the, 
I was raised in a really political environment, this constant reminder of history. So, you know, it sits there. I didn't really want to create the work to educate people. I thought that by focusing on these themes that were very personal to me, as a New York-based artist at the time, people would be able to see that, oh, it's, I don't have like an angle. I'm not trying to like, you know, get one over on people or whatever. I'm just trying to deal with something, explore something that is really personal to me. And they'll be able to relate to that. And I know, I know that when I play the music in places like Poland, for instance, like Warsaw, the most amazing thing about playing for Polish audiences is oftentimes people will come up to me after those shows and they'll share stories with me about their own humanness or their own family that shows me that they got something from it that went beyond you know, how it's being placed. And it used to upset me a little bit that people wanted to kind of, when the music came out, it was like, oh, she's exploring history, but she's, you know, it's so political. What? Like, I'm just, you know, or I've actually been turned down for, uh, for some things because people say, oh, it's, it's just too political. It makes people feel bad or... I'm like, okay, well, it makes you feel, I'm sorry. It makes you feel bad. History is awesome. I'm not trying to, I don't know. But I, I, I guess as an African-American person, African-American looking person who's, I'm so many things. I took all these DNA tests this year, actually. I'm so many things. But as this person, I do feel a particular kind of responsibility to, uh, I stand on the backs of so many people that never got a chance to express themselves. Everybody in this room can say something like that. But I particularly feel, because of what I know about American history, I know that to be true. So I feel a responsibility to make sure I'm really reaching and, and sharing the hard parts. Because the hard parts are where you have the real meat and the real kind of transformation. Um this kind of message music, I guess, is is making a comeback, certainly in pop music, I think, within the last year or so. You mentioned that you listen to some pop music. I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts on, on, on whether what people like, maybe Kendrick Lamar, Beyonce, um, I mean, it doesn't have to be them in particular, but what pop music is doing with message music, is it effective at all? Do you see, what are the precedents for it as well? Well, it's just so interesting because, I mean, to be... A black person in America means to pay attention. I'm a pop culture junkie. I pay a lot of attention to pop culture because it informs how people seem to see the black body. That's why it seems to inform. Pop culture informs how police officers are approaching, you know, harmless uh, black men who are in their car or... Uh, pop culture informs how this cop responds to Sandra Bland in her car saying, it's my car, I can do, I, I think she was smoking or something, and she said, you know, it's my car, I can do what I want to do in my car. Pop culture informs that, so I do pay a lot of attention to that. Message music, I just feel like the, all the music that I've ever listened to, that I've ever loved, from, you know, I mean, like, from Wu Tang to like Johnny Cash to it's all message music to me. And so what's happening now? I mean, Kendrick Lamar is a really, he's a really important figure. I feel like in the, in just music in general, in terms of the voice he's trying to give. Beyonce is a really, you know, she, I like to say Beyonce is like, Everybody has a part to play and everybody's doing what it is they can do. And I feel like she's doing what it is that she can do. And it's been really interesting how watching musicians who have to be brand conscious, how they move, how, you know, this the aesthetic that she's sharing now is not something new, but it's an aesthetic that she had to pull back for a while. Now she... <clears throat> she's so established, she can do whatever it is she wants to do. 
And so it's, it's fascinating and interesting in that way. I don't know. My fear is that what I see happening is kind of like a, the message music is pushing backwards to uh, sometimes to uh, a a uh, an intellectual area that we've already kind of been as a people. And that's the thing. That's the thing that troubles me. Like some of the language that I hear uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance, which I don't, I wouldn't say I'm a, I'm a lone soldier. I'm a lone wolf kind of person, but I do support that movement. But like some of the words that I hear are words that I also heard in the black power movement that my, my parents were a part of and just trying to figure out, okay, where did we like make a transition and where is the new language for how we talk about difference and why are we still talking about like, like it, like I hate the word white supremacy, white supremacists. Like I don't want to; those words are not in my vocabulary. I don't ever want to even voice them or say them. They speak to an earlier time for me, you know, where the Klan, you know, burned down my great grandmother's house and murdered her father, and you know, just all these things. That's what I think about when I think of white supremacy and white supremacists. What's going on right now is way more uglier than that. It's like, it's so, I just want, thank you. I just want like, I'm really hungry for a new language in terms of how we talk about these ideas. Can you elaborate maybe what you mean when you say it feels uglier? It's more sophisticated. It's, that's the great thing about, I was watching uh Who's that guy who has the the comedy guy with the afro, Kamau Bell? W. Kamau Bell. Yeah, W. Kamau Bell. He was talking about like how subtle racism has become and how people don't... I've had these conversations, too, where your friends don't even realize that that, that was a really racist moment that you just experienced. Like, it just completely went over their heads. It, Racism has a a new a new hidden face uh, that I just I don't even know how to and it's being festered and fostered by people like Donald Trump and like though I appreciate Donald Trump's audacity <laughs> he's so audacious it's just like wow he just really lives in his own alternative reality and that's it made him a billionaire being in this alternative reality but it's 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 feeding violence and it's feeding fear you know racism really just comes from fear that's what it is any sort of ism is really about a fear and so there's just kind of this bubbling under the surface in America right now with that. How does that, this bubbling under the surface, the names that you mentioned of these people have been murdered by police, um, how does that, has that disrupted kind of the work that, that you've been doing all along? It, I mean, it pisses me off. Like, I just... <sighs> I know some policemen who are actually wonderful people, so I'm just gonna say that before I continue. But I have met some some incredible people in law enforcement, and I've appreciated what they've been able to do in certain communities. But there's something really, really, really rotten um, that is just festering, and it makes it hard for people like me to kind of exist and not have to deal with being triggered all the time by, I mean, and it's a combination of not only these murders, but then like the media, of like the, you know, you could get PTSD from Twitter alone as a black person in America. As far as I'm concerned, it's just like, okay, this is this person, who's the next hashtag, blah, 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 or as a poor person, or as, you know, all these different things. 
it's I want to have progressive conversations about difference. I want to have uh, I want to have conversations in America that go beyond the dichotomy of black and white. I thought we dealt with that. No, we have not dealt with that. But I, that's the na- the naivety I was talking about. Like I had come to this assumption of yeah, no. As soon as Obama was in the White House, I mean. The people, the trolling of the Obamas is so intense. It's so, it represents a particular, it's mostly Trump supporters. Like it's this, this sort of, of fear. And I, the work that I'm dealing with is sometimes really painful to deal with in the first place. So to have to stack that on top, it slowed down my process a little bit. But it's also given me more to think about and more to more problems to solve. I like problem solving. Yeah. Let's listen to something from the third chapter. <clears throat> this is a, a song called Dreamer of Dreams. So, um, and again, another very different piece of music. Um, In some ways, I guess, to me anyway, it sounds like the most contemporary of all of the things that we've listened to. Is is there a linear progression to to the series? Yeah, there is, but it's, I've kind of jumbled it up. I mixed it up a little bit. If I had put things in order in the way that I wanted to, this chapter would have been the first record and then the first chapter would have been the second record and so on um some people really hated this record i this is my favorite in the series it's the one i can really listen to and get into myself without hearing all the things that i might have done differently in all the different roles i was playing in the other records what was different about making this record? <clears throat> well, it's completely, it's all overdubs. That's one. And it's, and all the process sounds are coming from the saxophone. That's a lot of people, a lot of people who've written about the music don't, they don't hear that. Um, it's not really explained clearly enough in the liner notes, but everything is rooted from the saxophone with the exception of the vocals. Um, and... It just has a, I wanted to create kind of like a fever dream uh, of sound, and it has that for me. This, it was also about water. Yes. <clears throat> so I became really, um, the last four or five years in New York, I became really fascinated with the water system and started doing more things with water in the city, which gave me a completely different, I imagine could do that in Montreal as well. Like I just, like I learned how to kayak and I was like doing like kayaking on the Hudson and like, um, and I learned how to surf and I was surfing in the Rockaways and was doing all these different things and understanding water gave me a new kind of sense of relief. When you're on a boat in the middle of the water somewhere in New York City, you feel a certain sense of space that you don't feel uh, normally like being on land. And so in combination with that, I started reading this diary of this uh, 1860s ship captain from England. Slavery was banned in England five years earlier than it was in the States. And so there was this guy Captain G.L. Sullivan, who was put in charge uh, by the uh, by the queen or whomever gave him his order, I can't remember, to intercept these illegal slave ships that were going to the West and to take the slaves back to Africa. And he kept a journal. Um, 
of that time. And within that book were some of the very first photographs of enslaved Africans that have ever been uh, from that slave trade that have ever been documented. So I started reading that. And, and then uh, within that time period, I moved onto a boat. And so water became this whole sort of thing and this whole new way of understanding not only music, but also understanding life. As you know, when you look at, uh, I was looking at the water the other day, the water is sometimes still, the water sometimes has waves, the water sometimes has really violent waves, the water sometimes has like kind of, really kind of milky waves, the water then is still. And that to me is what living life is very much like. It's like, it's this, just this movement through, this movement through, and you have to just wait for those moments when things are still again, and you have that for a while, and then you gotta go like that again, and then you gotta go like this again, and then you're back here again. Um, so I found it very therapeutic for my artistry. Um, you've talked a lot about history, you know, reading historical documents, your own family history, your experiences being in the world, moving in the world, kayaking, that kind of thing. Where does like digital inspiration kind of fit into, into what you do? Well, I mean, the first, the first digital collages to me were like the glory years of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Like the the 90s of uh, hip hop that I came up around. Like those were, they were the urban collages to me that I was heavily exposed to while also listening to a lot of classical music and a lot of jazz and a lot of just all these different sorts of things. And so- What were you listening to? Like. I don't know. I mean, like De La Soul, uh, a tribe called Quest, um, you know, East Coast stuff like Nas, and you know, again Wu Tang, and um, the West Coast. I, I've always loved their audacity. That's, but I've never been able to quite and and sonic like the sonicness of West Coast hip hop. I always found really interesting, but just the sample aesthetic in terms of my generation, like that is a a big thing. If you've ever been with somebody who's like a real bona fide sample crate digger, you know, I'm talking about like a bona fide crate digger who's just like in the crates, you know, and just really trying to find that thing and obsessing over like two bars of recorded sound. That's really something amazing um, to be around. And so I feel like my introduction to the digital came through that first and then went in other directions where I was exposed to um, many amazing uh, electronic artists like Marianne Amache, Mia Masaoka, um, Marina Rosenfeld, uh, Ania Lockwood, um, 20th century composers who were working with electronics. So I, you know, the great George Lewis, uh, trombonist and, and scholar from Chicago who is now based in New York, also very much in the digital realm and the, the com sort of the computer world. Though the com computers have been a part of my life, all of my life, so, but that's a whole other discussion, yeah. Well, I also wanted to kind of talk a bit about, I mean, about that exactly. I mean, when we were kind of emailing back and forth, you were talking about about kind of the prevalence of computers in our in our lives. And, and earlier you mentioned, you know, Twitter can give people PTSD. Oh, yeah. And how do you, you're, you're, you're synthesizing so much information, something that, you might want to incorporate into your music even, or to your, your art practice. I mean, how are you protecting your brain? I'm, I'm struggling. I, I think we're all struggling, but I'm trying to find different ways to operate. So I see, so the computer, my family had access to some, to like some of the early um, versions of computers because they're involved in academic communities and, and uh, revolutionary, uh, where knowledge, revolution was about knowledge. And so they saw the computer, the, the possibilities of the computer in the digital world as like a 
progression of revolutionary ideas in terms of how, and this is years before there was the internet, but just how computer communication could spread uh, revolution. And, and so now in the 21st century, I try to look at the computer and the internet, for instance, as an arts person, as a resource. I see it. And I try to figure out ways, of games of which I can play with it, where one, I'm learning something, and two, I'm spreading something, uh, and three, I'm connecting and creating community, because that's really what it should, should be about. Um, and so I struggle right now with just like, different social media platforms, for instance, like trying to figure out, well, what is useful and what is not useful. I find Twitter really useful for just spreading ideas, but I also find like Twitter can up your personal snark. Oh my God, like you could just, your Twitter could just be complaints from your whole day or your Twitter, or it can up kind of like some egocentric stuff. Your Twitter can be about what you ate today, what you bought today, who you hung out with today, you know. It's, uh, or your Twitter can be like your sort of, you, you want people to know that you, you know, just how, how conscious you are and that's what you, you know, so it's just, so I struggle with this. So I'm trying to figure out a way, for a while I was using it as a way to um, connect uh, a Black Lives Matter supporters and Black Lives Matter people together in terms of, you know, how uh, people will post like, you know, these uh, protesters need bail here or blah, blah, blah. Like there are all sorts of things you can do like that. Um, but now I'm trying to use it as a resource for mining the internet for ideas about creativity. Because I found that the political stuff that I, and I still place, I can't help. I watched the vice president debates last night, horrified. I could not, you know, just not say something. Um, but so I try to see each, I try to see the internet as just different corners of, of being resourceful and, and trying to place things. Like Instagram, for instance. I see Instagram as kind of like a game. I've quit Instagram like four or five times. I'm back on it again. And that's, and that's like the psychotic thing. Like these tools, these things that are supposed to bring us together are actually acting like drugs where they're upping... You're, you get on them because they up your dopamine levels, right? That's what, you know, like, you get off Twitter. And then as an artist, sometimes if you get too involved in, the, in that whole world, you'll get off the computer feeling like you creatively accomplished something when actually you did absolutely nothing. And you can have a whole career. You can, like, build a whole... It's like, what was that game that people used to play? You know what I'm talking Second Life. It's like you can build, like, a whole kind of second life between Instagram, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, um, you know, all these things. So I'm just trying to figure out different ways in which I can use them to create community, and that's how I'm trying to protect my brain. But I am actually failing. I, I said I was gonna announce today that I'm about to just quit everything, because it's also taking away from art time. I have to make stuff. I make stuff, you know? And so these tools, though they are resourceful, they're technically also marketing tools. So we're kind of like in this kind of marketing zone, marketing language, and it's, I find it really, really troubling, and I worry about coming, gener I worry about little girls and boys growing up now who are really ensconced in selfie culture and how damaging that is. I'm glad I didn't have to deal with that, though I met a kid the other day who's going to high school online, and I wish I could have been her. Imagine going to high school online. So you have to deal with all the bullshit. So it's just, they're different. You have to be careful what you take in. Sometimes on my Twitter, I change the location so that all the things that are trending, I have no idea. Like right now, the location is like, uh, 
somewhere in Eastern Europe, a town that I, I don't really know anything about. And so there are no hashtags that are going to come up on the trending to give me a heart attack. And sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to do that. Or I have blocks on my computer now. I have like, uh, there are a couple different ones that you can get that block you off of certain t sites for hours at a time. Because also as an artist, you'll have people who are trying to push you and to like promote, 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 right? You can, there's like a, there's a limit there. You have to, you have to find different ways of dealing with those things. I mean, you talked about young peop younger people being kind of more ensconced in this world. Do you, do you think, and may maybe some of the people in this room feel like that is like, that is an inevitable part of what it is they do. They have to be on these networks. Do you, do you see a different way through at all? Yeah, I do see a different way. I think, you know, the violinist Maz Swift, who's a really great musician that I, that I, that I really love, said something to me once about, you know, you should only do the things that you really want to do. You do not have to do what everybody else is doing in terms of, like, if you don't want to be on such and such site or such and such site, you don't have to. I remember when I quit MySpace and how revolutionary I thought. I quit MySpace and I'm never going back to, you know, any and then everyone of, quit MySpace. Yeah, and my, right? And then, you know, but now I'm on, you know, there's Facebook and there's, you know, all these things. Um, and, and the start of my career, I mean, I really was about, you know, shameless self-promotion. I was, I, that's the way I survived in New York in the beginning, just kind of like, nobody's going to know I'm out here if I don't let them know that I'm out here. And that's the power of the internet in terms of how it allows you as an arts person to remove the middle people that sometimes those people who really abused artists, you don't need them anymore. You can kind of get out there and, and push yourself. But there's a limit. It it uh, you have to be very careful in terms of how it affects your ego, in terms of what you think about yourself, in terms of what people say about you. You you don't want to take a lot of that in. You have to be kind of vigilant and and looking at those things as a segment of what you do. But I know some musicians and artists who don't participate in that world at all. So I think there's there's a possibility in there. I'm more interested also in those zones because a good my largest fan base is in Germany. What? <laughs> Germany. You know what I'm saying? So Germany is great, but that's that wouldn't have been possible without the internet. Or other corners of the world of people I know are listening to my music because they write to me, but I can't play shows there. How can I connect with them? Well, I can use the internet. So there are different ways. And then that can get really crazy because we, you know, I had an internet stalker for a little while. And that's a whole other conversation of like um, trolling and all these other things that take up time in your brain that you actually need to be making stuff. And so I sometimes wonder if like the quality of art making is going to go down because we're so distracted with these other things. I don't know. It's, uh, it's tricky and you just have to, you just have to do what, feel, again, this thing about instinct you have to, and intuition. You have to do what feels instinctually right for you. And on the internet, I read this in a really great book about God, I wish I remember the title about navigating uh, the internet world. This author said, it's important that you be yourself. It's important that what you place in these spaces, they are true. There is truth behind them. Because also, the internet is going to be, I've actually argued with writers who will say, Oh, you know, I, ha I know this and this and this about you. And I was like, oh, but that's not true. Oh, but it was on the internet. <laughs> what? I'm the person who's telling you that it's not true. It's like, well, it's on the internet. And so, and I'm like, what? So it's on the internet. And they're like, well, if it's on the internet, it's public record. 
what? But it was a mistake. But it's public record. You know, so it's, there are these new kind of zones and areas that we um, have to explore. At the same time, I really appreciate how the internet has allowed people to organize. It's really, you know, I believe like movements like Black Lives Matter and other things have happened because we also got to see what happened like with the Arab Spring. You know what I'm saying? Because we had, you know, and these other places where people are fighting and standing up for their people are happening because we've got, we're now starting to see ourselves not just as American citizens or Canadian citizens or North American citizens or whatever. We are global citizens. We are citizens of the world. And so that's the exciting thing about digital culture to me. I think it's time for us to Great. take some questions from from the participants. And hopefully there'll be a mic somewhere. Hello. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to preface my question by saying, um, you know, as a female jazz composer and trumpet player, um, someone who wants to do loads of different things that like conduct and bandied and write for orchestras and small groups. Um, yeah, when I was at music college and people were saying, you can't do all these things because it doesn't make any sense. And when I felt like I didn't have a place in music, and then when I found out about your music, I then had something to push back at them and say, fuck you, yes, I can. So thank you. OK, thank you. That warms my heart. Um, yeah, so thank you for being part of me. Thank um, you. Uh, I've got so many questions. Um, I kind of feel like you're here for me in a weird way, so I don't want to be too selfish. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, my first question. Um, how do you think we can use music, particularly jazz and improvised forms, to push, highlight, and heal the, the epigenetic and inherited trauma and systemic oppression that the African diaspora feels? How can we heal and highlight this? I mean, there's people doing it on things like social media, but how can we, how can we use art? How do you think we should be doing that? I think it's important to share your trauma. I think it's important to share your stories. I think it's important to bring out the most vulnerable sides of yourselves to share with people through your work. I think that heals. I think that um, not being afraid to just place your voice and to understand that there are people who cannot speak for themselves and so we have a responsibility to speak for them if they uh, so allow us to. Um, I, I really think that what you're asking about those starts at kind of like a grassroots level I think grassroots uh, organizing and, and setting up shows and spreading your music in that way is more important than uh, trying to um, find some sort of like national platform or international platform in a sense because it's these tiny corners. It's the, the, it's people falling into these cracks. It's people being forgotten about. It's communities being forgotten about. And I think uh, being able to take your music into those places does a lot more healing for the overall than having to be concerned about uh, kind of like the bigger picture. Um, like I think a lot about the dancer Catherine Dunham uh, she, a very famous dancer, she decided she was going to open a dance school, right? She could have opened it anywhere. She could have opened it in New York, you know, all, you know, all these places, any major city. And she decided to open her dance school in uh, East St. Louis, Missouri. And at that time, East St. Louis was a really incredibly crime-ridden place. And she saw that you know, these are the places that need the outreach. These are the places that need uh, some sort of service. You know, seeing your, I think seeing your music and your work as a form of service as an artist is really important. 
That's what I was going to say about the digital world. I see utilizing these different tools like Twitter, and Instagram, or all these things as a, you have to think about it as service. So when you think about it as service, then it, go, it takes it away from you, the person, and puts it back into like that healing space that people need. Um, I think you have the ability to really spread your music really far and wide in a way that composers that came before us were not able to do outside of touring. So I think that's something that could really be utilized. And I think just in terms of the African diaspora, the African Americanness, or just African peoples and the Americas, you have to remember to be an ally and remember that there's a difference between being an ally and, and being that otherness. Because sometimes that's the, that's the thing that's upsetting people. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. It's a great question, thanks. Yeah. Um, is it okay if I ask one more thing? Does anyone mind? Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, ask you about your use of words in your work. Um, so I remember one time when I was completely horrified, you know, doing a jazz degree, when I heard someone singing, you know, doing standards, American songbook stuff, they, they sang Strange Fruit, and they had no connection with the words. And they were just like, okay, one, two, let's just go. I don't know if anyone knows Strange Fruit. Um, Let's not talk about it here. Let's you can go off and look at it yourself <laughs> and take what you need from that. Um, but anyway, so I just was completely horrified, and um, uh, obviously, you know, jazz can be abstract and programmatic, and you you tell a lot of stories. Do you feel like you need the words sometimes in order to get your message across and for the for it to become more accessible rather than because I know for a lot of people who might listen, they might find. Uh, the instrumental stuff, perhaps esoteric. Like, do you need the words? Do you think sometimes? Well, I, I, my one of my number one goals is to spread ideas of of experimentalism to as many far corners as I can, and to bring people in to to make it a people's music, where it's not like kind of. I don't mind like high art stuff but I don't want to be that person. I want the person, I want the person who's like into the high art stuff, yeah, maybe to like it as I do the guy that sells lobsters around the corner from where I am in Brooklyn to like the church ladies uh, at the Harlem church I used to walk by when I was at Harlem, when I used to live in Harlem to, you know, uh, the police officer to the drug dealer, you know what I'm saying? Like I want everyone to be able to find a piece of something within the sound. And I find that narrative or the use of words is really powerful in terms of giving people something to hold on to while they swim through something that's unfamiliar. So yeah. That's Thank it. you. Thanks. Hi. Um, Hi. It was interesting when you talked about uh, water and your life because uh, a Chinese uh, philosopher, old Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, said that human life is like a water and let it just flow, let it spread. Anyway, um, I'm. My question is, uh, how do you make your academical ideas and the, or the view of of your society? and um, make that harmony with your musical stuff. Because um, actually, I am, I studied, I never studied musical stuff, or I never be into music stuff before. And I just studied um, philosophy or philosophy and political stuff in school. And I came here, I feel like I'm a different person from musicians here so feel like kind of oh what I'm doing here now uh, for a while but I'm I'm really good I'm really honored to be here and good I'm so happy with the great people now but I feel kind of strange for 
few days. So I'm curious, uh, how do you make your ideas on your music? Because I have some ideas and sometimes um, uh, I have a word. How can I put my words, my ideas to that abstract um, art stuff? Sometimes I'm, sometimes I have, how can I say it? Sometimes I struggle to do that. So I'm curious your opinion. Well, that's interesting. It's, it's uh, so you're talking about like how you like separating the, the, the abstract, like trying to connect the abstraction to the things that can be explained or, or how. Have you tried put uh, your many uh, social ideas or <coughs> Social view. Did you have you tried to put uh, on music without words? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's the basis of um, music composition to me, in a sense, or making, where you can, you know, you think about a feeling, you think about a certain feeling, and then all of a sudden you think about a feeling, and then you think about that feeling, and you close your eyes, and then all of a sudden you hear a sound. You hear sounds or you hear a melody or you hear a lyric or you hear, you know, it's, it's that, that's the abstraction for me, like trying to, the self-belief in making something out of absolutely nothing, but you have a springboard and I see intellectual ideas as a springboard into the abstraction. And so that's, that's something that's really helped me. I don't know if that really answered your question, though. OK. Thanks. Anybody else? More questions? OK. Hello. Hi. Um, uh, in, in line with uh, both uh, questions before, um, I feel like in improvisation, uh, now improvisational music, um, there is like an, an element of like showing to the audience that you can be free, that you can be like you can do whatever you want, because there is no score. There is uh, there is only uh, you and the, and the other musicians trying to make something out of nothing, and I think that that's a really like powerful element to it. Um, and I was wondering if uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is the place for experimental music in a culture uh, such as ours, uh, where mm, I feel like people are really afraid sometimes to hear something that they might not understand at first, or that not may not like uh, fit with what they expect a music performance to be like? And how do you deal with like, on the one hand, like being uh, free on stage or being free with with your composition or whatever? And like, uh, like you said, maybe using words to uh, have give people something to hold on to. And what other methods do you have to like uh, balance these two like sides of the of the of the issue? What are the two methods that I have to balance? Um, I'm, like you said, um, like you said uh, with, uh, that sometimes words can help people navigate like uh, this uh, unknown sonic territory. Um, so how, what, 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 besides that, what other tools do you have to like help people navigate your sound world or whatever and, and make them like, uh, get into the kind of thing that you're doing? I try different things sometimes in live performance. Another reason there are group singing in those coin coin pieces is because in live performance I make, I call the audience witness participants. I wish I had a better... I don't like the participant part. I like the witness. Witness audience to me means more kind of this like voyeuristic sort of thing. Witness to me means we're sort of all in this together. So one of the reasons there are those group singing things is I often make the witnesses sing with us. And making people sing with strangers is such an amazing thing. Even if they're not singing words, sometimes I just make them hum. Well, I play saxophone. I did that recently in Chicago. I just made them pedal for me. And it's a practice that 
trying to plug into the energy of a space. You should oft I think it's important to think about that when you play your music or present your art in particular spaces. You really need to think about the energy of the space and what the because the energy of the space in terms of improvised music to me informs the improvisation. And whereas I see and I don't see an even quote unquote free plane or whatever, and people have said that to me, like free plane. It's like, well, no, just like each and every person in here, we have our own perception about things. And your perception becomes kind of a foreshadowing and a projection of your person. So I see uh, improvisation, quote unquote free improvisation, as really composition in real time that's coming from you know these different perceptions. And it's also locked into uh, Reco this again intuition recognizing the energy within the silences so it's a really there are a lot of different things that you can do but that's one of the things that I've done thank you very much thanks sorry I know I'm not a participant but <laughs> I'm very very curious about something um, you spoke about creating allies uh, amongst social groups which I find really really fascinating especially amongst people like this and um I mean, you know, we have, as white people, like some of us have the fortune of like growing up with people of color and befriending them and <laughs> I guess getting a glimpse into their world about what they experience and uh, the kinds of oppression that, that they're subject to. I'm just really curious um, how moving forward um, you could recommend how white people can kind of stand in solidarity with like people of color. Um, in, in ways that are just not like beyond media or um, like sociocultural sort of ways? I, you know, gosh, it's such a painful question. That's such a painful territory that in the 21st century, that is a concern that we have to, we really have to talk out because it's not, it is not where it should be. I mean, I think just, you know, it just, it goes back to, you know, like, uh, it's kind of like a plantation politic for me when I think about it, like stories. And you see, you see reflections of kind of like, you see, ref I don't know how to explain this correctly. You see reflections of this past history on this present history. And uh, if you've read anything about like plantations and how we used to talk about how the slaves used to really watch and really pay attention to like the silent nuances of the masters and the overseers to really get an idea of how the master and the overseer were feeling that day so that you're always kind of one step ahead so that you know what's coming or what's going to happen. And I feel like that's something that white Americans of some, not all, have not had a particular training in of this like being able to really pay attention to the nuance and the silences and being able to really listen and so I bring that up in terms of having to to play an ally I think one of the most important things you can do is just be there be there for your friends that are struggling through this constant kind of media trauma that's happening, be there for, be there to listen and not give suggestions, for instance, just like be there, show some realm of support that's, uh, that's more kind of in this, this silent, nuanced way that you're kind of one step ahead of, of what you know is coming because you know another hashtag is coming. You know what I'm saying? So you know it's coming. So we know it's coming. We just don't know who it is yet. And so, how, you know, just try to be uh, that rock or, or that friend that your friend can depend on. It's, it's a, that's a really difficult question. Because again, it's, I find it really painful 
that anybody would have to even ask, you know, what can I as a white person do? It's the the fact that you're even asking that question shows that you're aware. You know what I'm saying? But the fact that we're that we even have to go in that direction, it's a uh, it's an untold, it's an unfinished tale that is not, we, I don't know where it's going to go. And so I don't know the best piece of advice to give for something like that, to be honest. Right. But you brought up a very interesting point about the master-slave relationship on a plantation because, and the reason why I'm asking for myself is on a very micro level. But when we extrapolate this, it's really the plantation still exists in a master-slave way in, in America. In, in, a, in a really, really terrifying way. Oh, yeah. I mean, the you know, it's... <laughs> all the things that you hear people who are putting down, quote-unquote, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance, all the things that they talk about are the people who are putting down, like, the, the fact that, oh, you know, well, the guy he got, you know, when, you, when a cop says, get out of your car, you should get out of your car. Or, you, or, you know, he looked like he... He had something, oh, and it looks like he had pot in his car or something in his car, blah, 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 blah. That stuff comes, people don't understand, like, how many cycles of generational trauma led to that particular moment. People don't like to look at connections. Like, it's, a, it's the same in America with the people say, who say, oh, you know, black people don't need reparations. It's not my fault that there was slavery, blah, 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 blah. Those were my ancestors. But the, the cyclical, um, just generational connections of poverty and trauma and racism and all these things that just build up on themselves generation after generation after generation, they're all connected. And that's a big problem. It's, uh, I just like the, I like the idea of going back and looking at the plantation in terms of looking at these hierarchies that we still, you know, have in America today. And it just, it pisses me off that in 2016, we're having to have these kind of conversations. Yeah. If you don't mind me interjecting. Go for it. Um, the first thing you can do, find the racism inside yourself, eliminate it, then find all of the races that you know, or no, no, not all of you know, all of your friends, find and locate what that is, do history on what that did to us, and that's a start, and it is true that it's very, very difficult to have that conversation right now. But it's, it's so critical because lynchings are still happening and they haven't, everyone else is shocked. I'm not, most, most African Americans are not shocked. This is the same as it ever, ever was. It's just that now it's almost cynical to us because it's like, oh, now you believe us because it's on film. But um, what I wanted to, that's, that's separate. I wanted to field a question to you, sis. Okay. Um, in terms of the youth, um, and in terms of what what's happening in our community in terms of music and and expression um, how how do you suggest we combat um, the larger commercial aspect of music taking the children that are lost crack babies and letting them express um, the basis ideas and, and concepts, how do we get them to pick up a horn? How do we get them to, not that you have the answer, but I mean to, to bring up the ideas. We're in this forum where we have all these young people with this opportunity. And how do we get, how do we get them to express themselves as open as possible? I mean, as an example, um, you're here and I'm here and we're here. But the fact of the matter is we're the minority and the, the minority of the minority of the minority. <laughs> so do you think that there's ever a point that we can, we can survive um, in our fullness in these, in these avant-garde, new, different, unseen, untracked forms? I mean, that's a... 
I mean, I feel like I'm from a generation where a lot of people I grew up with just got really... They they might have been in the avant-garde, but they left the avant-garde to go into popular music because popular music, you can make some money, yeah. you know, and it's nice to be able to... If you <clears throat> grow up poor, it's nice to be able to make a little something, something, you know? Yeah. And so, but then it's left kind of this dearth. In terms of grabbing the youth, I just feel like that's about exposure. And that goes kind of back to the question that you were asking earlier where I was talking about grassroots level. Like it's about taking our art and the things that we're doing into communities that um, uh, wouldn't be exposed to them in the same way. That's why I really love, like I love public art for that reason, like going, like seeing your work, again, as an extension of service. If you see your work as, an ex as a, a service, and I don't mean to like debase you or to debase it, but I think it's really needed right now. It's, I was in Memphis, uh, crazy, I airbnb a tent in some woman's backyard, don't ever do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was desperate. It was nineteen dollars a night, and I forgot it was Memphis. And I got there, and she gave me a flashlight, a can of mace, and <laughs> something else because she was like, "It's Memphis." I'm sorry, and she'd lock the house at night, and you just be out there. But anyway, so I was hanging out there, and I was talking to some elders there, and they were talking to me about how the reason the crime is so bad. Memphis is a great town, but it's not that safe. It's so bad because the kids don't have anything to do. They don't have anything to do. They don't have anything to do because there's nothing. No one's coming into the community to try to expose them to new ideas and to new things. And sometimes it means giving more than what you think you can give. The only reason that I can say I play saxophone, that I learned saxophone, is because I had a teacher who gave me an instrument. Do you understand? Yeah. Didn't charge me any money for anything. Just said, you're going to play this. I didn't even want to play the saxophone. I was like, I'm all about the clarinet. Nope, you're going to play sax. I can't afford a saxophone. Here's the saxophone. It takes things like that from all of us in here to reach people. So, I don't know. It's an ongoing struggle. Thank you. Thanks. Hey. Hey. Um, maybe circling back to the responsibility of an artist and what uh, Theo just asked for, like um, the possibilities of an artist. Um, you being a history buff, you, you know, talking about that and how you um, excel at using history for crafting your art. Um, the big problem of each generation, of every generation, seems to be to be aware of their own historicity, in a sense. So from that abstract feeling of there will be another hashtag, um, from that feeling of living in a twilight zone. How do you make erratic art from the very present? How do you make what art from the very present? Like like meaningful art. Not out of like history that has its own pathos already or the, the stories that, that the past brings, but um, you know, just that, that abstract feeling right now that, that's much harder to categorize maybe. Well, that's, yeah, and that to me goes back to the idea of exploring vulnerability. Like, that's where it's the, it's exploring, as an arts person, you don't have to, <clears throat> again, I pull on the history because I feel like I have a responsibility, and that just goes way beyond the art, that just goes, that goes back to like, you know, 1620 or whatever, you know what I'm saying? But it exploring vulnerabilities as an artist facing those creative things that scare you the most. The things that you think that you can't do are the things that you actually should be doing. The things that you think you probably couldn't make or do a good job at are actually the things that you should be making. That's what I feel like dealing with the, the present and just making sure that what you're doing is, has a truth to it that is your expression because life is so short I had friends already who've died way too young who were arts people. You know, they would kill to have a few more years to make something. So if life is actually that short, you might as well 
really do what it is that you want to do and just learn how to like weed out the, as you were talking before about teachers telling you that you just, oh, okay, cool. I'm still going to go, I'm going to do this. You know, you can't, and I get a lot from the punk aesthetic with that where you never have to ask permission to do what it is that you want to do. You just need to do it because you don't know if tomorrow is guaranteed. You know what I'm, and I'm not, let's knock on some wood. I'm not trying to say that, but you know what I'm saying? So like, just go for it with a gusto and don't look back. Hi, I have a question about, um, you're talking about developing a new language. Uh, I was thinking about history and when things keep coming up repeatedly, the old language used in that, that might reinforce that that issue coming up and up again. Does that make sense? Wait, say it again? Like certain words or certain, for, God, it's hard to explain. You're talking about a new language. And what's some of like the old language that you think is not working anymore? Or do you think there's just certain old language that's being repeated so much that it's reinforcing the same ideas from the past and they're just gonna create this cycle over and over again? Well, in the way that racism has gotten incredibly sophisticated, it means that the words, I feel like, like the word racist and the word sexist, for instance, when that is directed at your person, or even when I utter those words, there's such an emotionality to it. You feel such a like, ah, oh, you know, like, ah, oh, ah, oh, you know, sort of thing that kind of blocks your intellectual capacity for critical thinking about the actual idea. And so that's like, I want to be able, it's like, okay, I take it back to Twitter. It's like how you watch like uh, different, um, media outlets report different things and in terms of the language they use to kind of incite versus language they use just to place. Like, this is what happened. Oh, but this is what happened because it happened this way. You know, it's, God, I wish I could come up with it, like a really quick example. But it's sort of that sort of um, thing where we have to find a different way of engaging people who have ideas that are that are technically racist maybe technically sexist let's figure out a way to actually talk around that and get deeper into the core issue which is not even about again it's not about color it's not about gender it's about fear people fearing each other, people fearing the things that they don't know, people fearing like a cultural understanding that has been kind of co-opted by pop culture in very almost kind of demonic ways, in my opinion, in terms of uh, um, uh, demonizing a people <clears throat> just based on a choice. And so I just, I love... I love critical thinking. I love, you know, for instance, that someone could put on my record and go, oh, I really hate, I don't know what she did there, but I hate it. Great. Because that means that you're thinking, you're making these categories uh, that will allow you to go into a deeper area of thinking about something that you might like and things of that nature. So I think it's our responsibility with our friends, our colleagues, our compatriots, our comrades or whatever to, to, to push engagement, and I think it's really important to push engagement with people you don't, you could never see yourself having those conversations with. So, yeah, thank you. That just makes me think about something like social media, which I'm like, just have a deep aversion to. I could go in and out too, because I see all these conversations happening in these fragmented sentences, and people starting these conversations that are the beginning of something very deep, and then someone responds with another short answer and then another short answer. And it's like people are trying to understand each other, but it doesn't seem like it becomes, to me, really confusing. It makes me just want to shut it all down because it, in that way it doesn't seem like the right platform to me. Um, yeah, you know, it's so interesting. Like the internet is supposed to connect us, but yet it's making us more disconnected sometimes. 
I, in that way. Yeah. I have just one more sure. kind of question. Sorry. Um, I've been thinking a lot about culture in the United States because it's a really a place of, you know, immigrants, the whole, mo a lot of the people living there are refugees, immigrants, or people who were forced to come there. I come from a, like, refugee situation, basically. Um, and I don't know anything about my culture. And a lot of people don't know about, like, the Armenian genocide, something yeah. that we've been trying to uh, recognize and is still not recognized by the United States um, or a lot of places. I think it's really important for people to keep their culture and their cultural identity intact and I think it's really segregated in the United States. I don't really know how we can start integrating and learning about each other's cultures instead of just kind of making all these like sweeping uh, assumptions. We all moved here kind of out of like desperation or whatever it is and we just kind of never got to adjust to each other. It's like, it's a really amazing opportunity and it's also really terrible. It just seems like it's never gonna stop. I don't, I, don't, I mean, don't give, don't, hey, be an optimist. No, I know. <laughs> Sorry, I just think, like, I know, this conversation could last a really long time and I was like kind of fearing bringing this one up because I do have optimism and I think something about like the Armenians is like all we really are asking for is acknowledgement. People want to be acknowledged. Um, I, yeah. I mean, in America, uh, to be quite honest with you, like, I... America, the United States of America, and I say this as somebody who, you know, I am oddly patriotic in a really weird way. Like, I have a, a deep hatred for some of that history, but I also have a deep love for it because it made me, you know, so I'm able to kind of like, okay, it's that double consciousness. Um, but the United States of America still has not dealt with its recognition of its indigenous people. It has, like, it's, it's, it's like, in Canada, I feel it's, I mean, Canadian indigenous people, there's still a big problem here, but America's, there's even something even more sinister going on with that where, you know, everybody's talking about borders and Trump is talking about borders and it's just like, oh, these are, these were stolen borders. No one's talking, the borders. This sto California used to be Mexico, you know what I'm saying? Like what, you know, so the fact that, I feel like the fact that America can't even deal with its indigenous issue until we can deal with that, dealing with other issues of mass genocide and trauma is still incredibly difficult. And it requires that someone like you or someone like me within our particular cultures try to push through that history in a way that doesn't breed contempt, in a way that breeds love. That's like, that's what's really missing, like the the love when everybody's talking about these differences and and and, and whatnot. Yeah. I want to just keep talking to you. <laughs> I'm going to someone take the mic away. <laughs> it's okay. Great questions. Thank you. Hello. How are Hi. you? Hi. I wanted to get back to the music a little bit. Sure. Because I think like the solution will be in the music. Like a lot of music's being made and it's what's going to heal us, even if it's only in 10 years or 20 years, like a lot of music you discover now, or I've discovered. And I wanted to ask you if you feel the power or the connection to people who have made music like yours prior to you, because I hear it a lot when I hear your music. You know, it reminds me of Black Jazz, Strata East. It reminds me of what I've heard an artist like Sun Ra, Sun Ra called uh, the music of the spheres, that kind of like black opera music. It's oh. very, it's very healing, I find. Thank you. And after hearing the second song you played in your great-grandfather's uh, lyrics, oh. I, I, I heard that there, and it, it repeats itself. Like, I can go back 40 years, 30, 20, and now I hear that. And I'm asking if you feel a connection to all those artists 
that that tradition of that music or if you just kind of came across it through sheer intuition no i mean i grew up around uh, uh my parents were avid record collectors and show people like we they take i'd be the baby at the show you know what i'm saying at like the avant-garde experimental show i'd be the kid in the corner back there i took it sun Ra was a big part of my i have some crazy stories about that just a big part of my upbringing i have people in my family that lied to get into sun Ra's funeral saying they were kin you know just stuff like that it's i've been exposed to this type of music and avant-garde thinking for a really long time so it it shows up but also i mean in terms of like using my great grandfather's music and and doing kind of all this ancestral stuff in a sense when i pass over um you know god willing whenever that's supposed to be i just want them to know me when i come through there i think about that a lot i want them to know that their lives were not that they did not suffer the sufferings I, my i have a grandmother way back who was a slave breeder i have actual documentation that she she had 25 children um and most of them were sold you know and so things like that i want those people to know that all that stuff that they kind of uh pushed through made it possible for me to have a really dynamic existence and i think i want to i think there's some part in my psyche where i just want to place that and that's the connect i see but yeah but then the great you know coming out of chicago i didn't spend all of my formative years in chicago but i spent a, a fair amount and the lineage of musicians coming out of there where they all sounded like themselves i pull a lot from that where within like especially on saxophone within like 30 seconds i can tell you who's playing saxophone you know when you listen to some of those old records it's like yes or like i heard anthony the great anthony braxton once say uh the at a workshop he said the tradition in this music is about being creative period there's no extra it's about being creative period nothing not being creative this way being creative that way just being creative because again life is so short you might as well explore what it is you need to explore before you get taken out of here to go to wherever is next. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you.